The people should subject the party in power to severe criticism and press and impel it to give up its one party, one class dictatorship and act according to the opinions of the people. The second matter concerns freedom of speech, assembly and association for the people. Without such freedom, it will be impossible to carry out the democratic reconstruction of the political system. May 3rd, 1937. Do we want to abolish state power? Yes, we do, but not right now. We cannot do it yet. Why? Because imperialism still exists. Because domestic reaction still exists. Because classes still exist in our country. Our present task is to strengthen the people's state apparatus, mainly the people's army, the people's police, and the people's courts, in order to consolidate national defense and protect the people's interests. June 3rd, 1949. This is the end. Beautiful prayer. Greetings, kittens. Welcome to the podcast of Doom, the, the podcast devoted to epic failure analysis. I'm your host, David Appleson. Those two quotations I just read were both from Mao Zedong, Communist China's founder and first leader. The difference between the two quotations is that the first one was in the years before Mao and the communists took control of the country, and the second was shortly after Mao took control. And it demonstrates how a person's views towards freedom of speech, assembly, and personal acquaintances can change very drastically from the time you are fighting against the government and all they stand for, and when you control the government and are fighting to maintain your grip on power. Today we are going to examine the government crackdown at Tiananmen Square in Beijing, China. Anywhere from hundreds to over a thousand people were killed when the Communist Party leaders decided to use the full power of the nation's army to crack down on its own people because they dared to ask for free elections and a greater personal freedoms. The final massacre took place on the morning of June 4, 1989. But the events that led up to this confrontation lasted for more than a month and were viewed on live television by people all over the world. The Spanish sociologist and political scientist Juan José Linz defined authoritarianism with four attributes. One, it is a regime that tightly controls the memberships of such government institutions as legislatures, political parties, and interest groups. Two, its basis for legitimacy is based on emotion particularly the identification of the regime as a necessary force to combat easily recognizable societal problems such as underdevelopment or insurgency. Three, there is little opportunity to publicly voice opposition due to the violent suppression or incarceration of political opponents. And four, executive power is informally defined and its limitations often shift according to current needs. The Encyclopedia Britannica adds that authoritarianism denotes any political system that concentrates power in the hands of a leader or a small elite that is not constitutionally responsible to the body of the people. The leaders often exercise power arbitrarily and without regard to existing bodies of law, and there's a notable absence of elections that include actual competitors with equal chances of winning. Basically, it's a government that doesn't allow freedom of thought or action and places power into the hands of a small elite that is not democratically responsible to the citizens. It differs mostly from totalitarianism in that under totalitarianism, there is a highly charismatic dictator at the head of the government. Such examples include Germany under Hitler, Italy under Mussolini, the Soviet Union under Stalin, North Korea under Kim Jong-un, and China under Mao Zedong. Following the death of Mao, China transitioned from a totalitarian government run by a cult of personality to an authoritarian government run by a small clique of party leaders. China tumbled out of the chaos and tumult caused by the Cultural Revolution when its patriarch and first leader, Mao Zedong, died in September 1976. Leadership briefly fell to the powerful gang of four leaders, which included Mao's wife, Jian Qing. But following their disastrous handling of popular opponent Zhou Enlai's funeral, the gang of four lost their grip on the levers of power. With the abrupt arrest and conviction of the gang of four, communist China headed into uncharted waters. Mao Zedong was no longer ruling the country. And like the Soviet Union after Stalin, the nation needed to determine what direction to go after the end of Mao's cult of personality. The first to step up was Hua Guofeng, the premier. 
he consolidated power with some of the other Politburo members and eventually won over the loyalty of the People's Liberation Army, which was key to holding power in China. Hua headed a triumvirate that was not long for this world. He favored a Stalinist-style economy, relying on a heavy government hand to increase industrial and agricultural production, which often fell short of that government's lofty goals. Hua found himself in direct conflict with Deng Xiaoping, the former vice premier who had been disgraced in the last years of Mao's rule for not being sufficiently communist enough. Redeemed with the death of Mao and the abrupt ending to the Gang of Four, Deng opposed Hua's central planning for a more market-oriented economy that encouraged private enterprise. Deng had a better sense of which way the political and economic winds were blowing and managed to outmaneuver Hua. By 1980, Deng was the de facto leader of China, having pushed aside Hua. The Cultural Revolution had left China in an economic and social quagmire by the time Deng took control. He immediately moved to defang those who had gained the most from its upheavals. Proponents of the revolution were kicked out of party leadership positions, and criticism of the revolution was encouraged and vented in public. At the same time, Deng moved forward with his market reforms. Rural farms were returned to individual ownership, and state-owned enterprises were allowed to retain profits. The economy was opened up to foreign trade. Boeing sold China airplanes, and Coca-Cola opened a bottling facility in Shanghai. Relations with Japan, a longtime adversary, also improved. Within a few years, national production increased by leaps and bounds, and poverty was dramatically reduced. In 1980, Hu Yaobang was named General Secretary of the Communist Party, while Hua Guofeng was demoted. Also, it should be noted that calls for reform and a change in government were taking place in other communist regimes, first in Poland and then in Hungary. News of these reform movements would have filtered back to China. In late 1978, early 1979, a democracy wall was allowed to operate, upon which posters were pinned freely criticizing government wrongdoing. But following a costly border war with Vietnam that did not end well for the Chinese, Deng began attacking the activists. In March 1979, Deng laid out the four cardinal principles as a response to calls for greater democracy. The four principles were, 1. China's economy must adhere to the socialist road. 2. The People's Democratic Dictatorship is China's form of government, meaning all decisions are made at the party leadership level. 3. The Communist Party's leadership is unchallengeable, just in case you had some frisky ideas about what a people's democratic dictatorship really meant. And 4. Marxist-Leninist Mao Zedong thought is the official ideology, although its true meaning is widely open to interpretation. This bipolar approach to governing, full speed ahead on economic reforms while cracking down on individual free thought, liberties, and actual democratic-style representation, led to a number of problems. The economic reforms were generally well received by the public, but some problems were becoming readily apparent. The new openness was leading to corruption and nepotism in the system. It seemed that if you wanted to get ahead in this new China, you needed either a friend or a relative in the government. That was the key to landing business licenses, crucial supplies, and most importantly, government approval. Many of the new business leaders came from the old party leadership or their close family. Those without these important connections soon found themselves on the outside looking in on the new prosperity. The reforms created a two-tiered system in regards to pricing. In some instances, the long-held tradition of the government maintaining low prices was kept in place, while in other instances, the market was allowed to run free. Thus, a clever, well-connected person had the opportunity to buy commodities low and sell them high, while most consumers were left paying lofty prices for commodities they once bought cheap. That led to rising inflation. In 1988, the government tightened the money supply and it suddenly became difficult to get a loan, which is a problem in any economy. That year, the government agreed to move the entire economy to market-based pricing, so no more government controls. That triggered a wave of cash withdrawals with buying and hoarding of currency. Two weeks later, the government rescinded this decision, but inflation was already skyrocketing and goods became highly unaffordable.
Add to these troubles that under the new economy, state-owned enterprises were pressured to generate a profit or cut their infrastructure. That meant layoffs, and a vast segment of the population was faced with unemployment and a loss of housing and medical benefits. Everyone who didn't have one of those golden contacts within the government felt the pinch. During this time, calls for reform and greater democratic representation kept rising. People wanted a greater say in these important economic decisions that were affecting their everyday lives. Among the nation's many universities, students were realizing they were not getting the education they needed for this new, open economy. And they were hearing from other students who had been studying abroad in countries where they were exposed to successful Western-style democracies. The government had been channeling the students into the social sciences and humanities, while the new economy needed specialists in agriculture, light industry, services, and most importantly, people who knew how to attract foreign investment. And private firms were no longer required to hire graduates who were lacking in these skills. The students could see the writing on the wall. They were being trained for jobs that didn't exist, and they were faced with a lifetime of chronic un- or underemployment. As a result, college students became more politically active. Groups like Democracy Salon and the Lawn Salon began cropping up on university campuses, encouraging students to get more politically involved and to demand more democratic reforms. Starting in December 1986, student demonstrations picked up in China, starting in the city of Hefei near Shanghai. The students, like many Chinese, were outraged by the 16% inflation rate, which made buying even the basic necessities difficult. In addition, they were quite upset about the government corruption and nepotism that made it nearly impossible for the not-so-well-connected to get a good job, or any job for that matter. The children of Deng were particularly targets of their ire. Two intellectuals moved to the forefront of these demonstrations, voicing the concerns of the students. The first was Fang Lutzi, an astrophysics professor and vice president at the University of Science and Technology of China. And the second was Liu Binyan, vice chairman of the Chinese Writers Association and one of the country's most famous writers. In 1980, Fang had declared that socialism was a dead ideology for China. By 1986, he had become an outspoken critic of China's policies toward its intellectuals. He advocated academic freedom, openness to new ideas from abroad, and intellectual resistance to party control. In a speech at Tongji University, he stressed that human rights were a critical component of any democratic agenda and that human rights should not be dependent on state or national government largesse. Contradicting ancient Chinese traditions, Fang advocated the rights of the individual over the safety and well-being of the group. He also stated that the rights in the Chinese constitution should be actual rights and not just on-paper rights. He mocked the government's position that Chinese civilization was inherently superior to all others. Chinese intellectual life, material civilization, and moral fiber are in dire straits, he said. The truth is, every aspect of the Chinese world needs to be modernized. I think all-around openness is the only way to modernize. I believe in such a thorough and comprehensive liberalization because Chinese culture is not just backward in a particular respect, but primitive in an overall sense. The speeches offered encouragement to students to demonstrate and assemble in order to protest the government. Students from around the country were able to listen to these speeches when audio recordings were spread throughout college campuses. In his 1979 novella, People Are Monsters, Liu Binyan detailed the influence peddling, bribery, embezzlement, and corruption of a provincial party clique. He compared the local Communist Party to a mafia-like crime syndicate. The Communist Party regulates everything, but it does not regulate the Communist Party, he wrote. During the student demonstrations, he spoke out in a series of scathing indictments of party corruption and malfeasance. Liu was constantly in demand as a speaker and a writer by those seeking greater reform. Soon the demonstrations spread to campuses throughout the major cities of China. On December 19, 1986, the local authorities in Shanghai called in the police to break up the demonstration there. Students in Hefei responded by staging a sit-in. 
Fang Lutzi worked as a mediator between the students and the government. He was able to end the sit-in on condition that the students' demands were forwarded to the Shanghai local government. The number of demonstrators was limited, and the various student groups could not agree on their priorities. By mid-January 1987, all of the students had returned to their classes. Although it appeared that any real threat of change to the way the Chinese government was running their country had been quietly snuffed out, that is not how the party leaders treated it. The central party leadership was alarmed by the actions of the students and the intellectuals supporting and driving their cause. Somebody within the party needed to take the blame for the student demonstrations and for not cracking down on them sooner. That somebody was Hu Yao Bang, the general secretary who had been one of Deng's closest allies when Deng came to power. He had now become the favorite scapegoat of the party hardliners. Who was blamed for mishandling the student demonstrations and undermining the social stability of the country? He was dismissed from office on January 16, 1987, and everyone not blamed for the demonstrations felt much better. Following whose resignation, the party began the anti-bourgeois liberalization campaign, which took aim at who, political liberalization, which you can read as anti-government sentiments, and Western-inspired ideas in general. The campaign cracked down on those who had protested and tightened the political environment. But in spite of the party's efforts, who remained popular among progressives within the party, intellectuals and students. For the next two years, the reform effort continued mostly through the work of the intellectuals, and the government kept close tabs on it to make certain no public displays of support for reform took place. On April 15, 1989, Hu Yaobang died suddenly from a heart attack at the age of 73. It was one of those events in Chinese history where a natural death had far greater repercussions than one might have at first expected. During his two years out of office, Hu's reputation as an advocate of reform had been greatly enhanced, although he had taken little action to support the cause of reform during that time. Students across the nation were profoundly moved by the death of the former party leader. They believed he represented their reformist ideas of openness and democracy. Posters began cropping up on campuses eulogizing Hu and calling for a revival of his legacy. But soon the nature of the posters moved away from the topic of who and on to broader political issues such as freedom of the press, greater representation, and calls to end corruption. Crowds of students gathered around the Monument of Heroes at Tiananmen Square, the enormous central plaza in Beijing where the seat of government was located. The monument was a ten-story high obelisk built shortly after the communists took control and dedicated to those who had given their lives during the 19th and 20th century to the cause of revolutionary struggle. The students now congregating at its base felt that this mantle of honorable struggle had rightfully passed to them. Other students were erecting shrines on their campuses but were soon marching to Tiananmen and joining up with the students already gathered there. As the crowds grew bigger, the police were eventually called in to make certain order was maintained. The next day, the Central Committee, or the main leaders of the Communist Party, decided to allow whose remains to lie in state in the Great Hall of the People so that citizens could pay their respects. A state-run memorial would take place on April 22nd. It was an unusual move for a party leader forced out of office. That evening, 500 students reached the Great Hall of the People to mourn who, but also to publicly discuss social problems. That gathering was quickly broken up by the local police. On April 17th, students from the China University of Political Science and Law made a large wreath to commemorate Hu. Its lane party drew a larger-than-expected crowd. 3,000 students from Beijing University walked 12 miles to join the other students in the square, while another 1,000 students arrived from Tsinghua University. This coming together of students led to discussions and the sharing of ideas. They delivered a petition to the Standing Committee of the People's Congress and called it the Seven Demands. Here they are. 1. A firm is correct Hu Yaobang's views on democracy and freedom. 2. Admit that the campaigns against spiritual pollution and bourgeois liberalization had been wrong. 3. Publish information on the income of state leaders and their family members. 4. End the ban on privately run newspapers and stop press censorship. 5. 
increase funding for education and raise intellectuals' pay, six, end restrictions on demonstrations in Beijing, and seven, provide objective coverage of students in official media. I'm sure this list of demands was not well received by the party leadership. Citizens were not supposed to make demands of their leaders. This was, after all, a representative government. On the morning of April 18th, there was still a significant number of students in the square. They remained gathered around the monument to the people's heroes, singing patriotic songs, giving speeches demanding reforms, and continuing their discussion about how to bring about the change they sought. At first, their numbers were small, but soon they were joined by other students marching from other universities, such as the People's University and the Beijing Academy. By the afternoon, more than 30,000 people had gathered in the square. That night, they delivered a wreath to Shi Hua Men Gate, the entrance to Zhuang Nanhai, the headquarters of the Central Committee of the CCP, the Communist Party's leadership. They were met by a human wall of armed police, By now, there were more than 10,000 people crowded at Shiwamen Gate, and they were clashing with the police. Eventually, the police gained control of the situation, and by 5 a.m. the next morning, the square was cleared. But later that day, on April 19th, more students returned to Tiananmen Square. They were carrying huge portraits of Hu Xiaobang and hanging posters praising his work and the issues he fought for. By 8 o'clock that evening, the crowd had grown to 100,000 people and citizens had joined the students. A petition, including the seven demands, was personally presented to some deputies of the National People's Congress. Many in the crowd took up singing the Internationale, the anthem for world communists that originated in the communes of Paris in the 19th century. Meanwhile, a crowd of 3,000 protesters had gathered at Fudin University in Shanghai. The protest was spreading. At 2.30 in the morning, 2,000 police arrived to break up the crowds at Shiwamen Gate. They attacked the people there with clubs, brass belt buckles, and steel-toed shoes. The demonstrators fought back by hurling glass bottles. More than 100 students and four policemen were injured. After some arrests, order was finally restored to the square just around dawn. However, this event angered many students and citizens. The students spent most of the day of April 20th organizing, selecting their leaders, and developing the themes and demands of their movement. They sent out a letter addressed to all the universities of China. The letter read, The past failures of student movements have made us realize that we would have no power if we did not form an organization including representatives from all colleges and from all levels of society. We therefore propose that all colleges send their deputies to help organize the College Council of the Beijing Democratic Movement. The letter also called for using peaceful methods to protest in order to get the government to comply with their requests, such as sit-downs, demonstrations, school boycotts, and hunger strikes. That night, 1,000 students from Nanjing University marched to the provincial capital in that city shouting, Clean up the government! And down with the dictatorship! During those demonstrations, angry students threw glass bottles at the symbols of the government. The demonstrations were spreading to other campuses, and a group of factory workers calling themselves the Beijing Workers' Autonomous Federation issued two handbills challenging the central leadership. On Friday, April 21st, the first student boycott of classes began. It started at Beijing Yunhua, the University of Political Sciences and Law, and Beijing Normal University. By that afternoon, more than 100,000 students marched into Tiananmen Square. Many returned to Shiwamen Gate, where they denounced the previous day's violent incident as an atrocity. On April 22nd, the memorial was held for Hu Yabang. Police moved in from the surrounding suburbs overnight to maintain order inside the square. More than 200,000 students and citizens arrived for the memorial. When a band initiated the memorial by playing the national anthem, it was said that all in attendance joined in singing along. The funeral that took place inside the Great Hall was broadcast live to the students. General Secretary Zhao Zuyang delivered the eulogy. To many observers, the funeral seemed rushed, only lasting 40 minutes. Emotions ran high in the square. Students wept. The memorial proceeded without event and ended by noon. After the cordons came down, the students continued their demonstration by asking for a dialogue with Premier Li Peng. 
As the motorcade carrying whose remains proceeded through the city of Beijing, more than one million people lined the route to pay their respects. Back in the square, three students kneeled at the Great Hall, holding above them a petition that they asked Li Ping to accept. However, Li Ping refused to meet with them. The students left the steps, warning the government that if they continued to refuse to meet, a general strike of workers, peasants, and intellectuals would be called. The next day, a Sunday, most of the action was found outside of Beijing. A riot broke out in the city of Xi'an. Their students or criminals, depending on whose side you listen to, clashed with police and forced their way into a government building. They set one room on fire before forcing their way into the offices of the courthouse. Cars, buses, and an oil depot were set on fire before general looting took place. Similar incidents happened in Changsha. There, they stole from and set fire to local businesses. Police arrested more than 100 people, but both sides agreed it was the actions of career criminals. In response to these riots, the students in Tiananmen Square withdrew for the day. Also on that day, the Science and Technology Daily News was the first Chinese newspaper to break through the wall of censorship and report on the student demonstrations. On April 25th, the government cut off telephone and telegram service at the Beijing University campus, severely restricting how students there could communicate with each other. There were rumors that the 39th Infantry of the People's Liberation Army were being moved into the city, making students feel uneasy. On some of the Beijing campuses, students were seen burning copies of news publications such as Kyo Shi, the People's Daily, and the Beijing Daily to protest the false reporting of the news and to demand freedom of the press. The China-based Economic Herald reported that student speakers claimed that the Central Committee of the Party made a mistake when it dismissed Hu in 1987. In retaliation, the Politburo ordered that 300,000 copies of the paper be confiscated and the report removed. In response, the Herald republished that day's paper with a large blank area where the article would have appeared. Student leaders also met that day and agreed on an organized nationwide student strike to occur on May 4th. On the morning of April 26th, President Yan Shan Kun and Premier Li Peng met with Deng Xiaoping. Encouraged by Li Peng, Deng endorsed a hardline stance and said an appropriate warning must be disseminated via mass media to curb further demonstrations. The meeting firmly established the first official evaluation of the protests from the leadership and highlighted Deng's having final say on important issues. In response, the People's Daily published an editorial under the title, Take a Clear-Cut Stand Against Unrest. The editorial claimed that a handful of people with ulterior motives have continued to use the grief of students to create turmoil. Their sole purpose is to poison people's minds, create national turmoil, and sabotage the nation's stability. This is a planned conspiracy designed to discredit the party leadership and overthrow the socialist system. It is the duty of all people to unite in a stand against public disturbances and protect China's political stability. The editorial backfired. Instead of scaring students into submission, it completely antagonized the students against the government. The polarizing nature of the editorial made it a major sticking point for the remainder of the protests. The editorial evoked memories of the Cultural Revolution, employing similar rhetoric, and bringing back memories of government heavy-handedness. Later that day, the Central Committee of the CCP ordered the 38th Army into the capital from Baoding. The 38th were considered the elite guard. They were the most loyal to Deng and numbered more than 20,000 troops. Early on the morning of April 27th, more than 200,000 students marched up to 25 miles through the streets of Beijing to gather in Tiananmen Square. It is said that more than a million citizens, including factory workers, lined the streets, encouraging them as they marched. The students broke through a police cordon that consisted of 18 rows of policemen and women interlocking their arms. Although the police put up a good resistance, the mass of students was just too much to hold back. As the students broke through, they shouted, The people's police have the love of the people. They countered the editorial with posters stating, 
peaceful petition is not turmoil, and long live democracy and freedom of the press. Some posters called for the overthrow of the government. That afternoon, an announcement was made by State Council spokesman Hyun Ma, representing the government. We welcome the students into direct dialogues with us. We can conduct these dialogues also as it is done in a proper atmosphere. The students must return to their classes. They must state their opinions through the proper channels and adopt a calm and reasonable attitude. Finally, we will accept demands only from the recognized student leadership of the Federated of Beijing Student Unions, and we will hold discussions only with those leaders. The statement was issued in response to the return of Zhao Zuyang, the moderate leader who had been away on business in North Korea. Deng favored his conciliatory approach over the more aggressive tactics of Li Ping. Zhao opened up a dialogue with the students, gave speeches praising the actions of the students, and lifted some of the press censorship. Many of the students were satisfied by Zhao's gestures, and the numbers attending the demonstrations in Tiananmen Square began to drop. On May 4th, the day of the planned boycott, most of the students had already returned to their campuses. But students in other cities did mark May 4th, the 70th anniversary of the public demonstration that kick-started modern Chinese nationalism to protest the injustices they perceived. Students took to the streets in Nanjing, Zhejiang, Guangzhou, Changsha, and Jian. For the next few days, student participation in demonstrations continued to decline. On May 7th, Li Peng shut down the offices of the Economic Herald in retaliation for its decision to publish editorials critical of the government. On May 13th, 2,000 Beijing University students marched to Tiananmen Square where they began a hunger strike, demanding a dialogue with the party leadership, and also to draw the attention of Mikhail Gorbachev. In anticipation of his visit to China on May 15th, the students sent the Soviet leader an invitation to meet with them. Gorbachev, by this time, had already initiated Glasnost, the opening of Soviet society, and the students were hoping to gain a sympathetic ear from the world's other major communist nation. At this time, the students announced a fasting declaration and took an oath to stay with it until the government agreed to meet with them as equals. The hunger strikers wore coats that read, Without democracy, we would rather die. That afternoon, more than 300,000 people flocked to Tiananmen Square to show their support for the hunger strikers. However, the government was also coordinating its efforts that day. Yan Mingfu, head of the party's united front, called an emergency meeting, gathering prominent student leaders and intellectuals, including Lu Xiaobao, Chen Ziming, and Wang Juntao. Yan told them the government was preparing to hold immediate dialogue with the student representatives, but that the Tiananmen welcoming ceremony for Gorbachev would be canceled whether the students withdrew or not, in effect removing the bargaining power the students thought they possessed. Yan's announcement sent the student leadership into disarray. After 50 hours of fasting, 130 of the 2,000 hunger strikers collapsed from exhaustion and were taken to a hospital. A police cordon was placed around Tiananmen Square, but no action had taken place between the police and the students. The dialogue continued between student leader Li Taiying and the government's representative Yan Mingfu. Yan told Li that the dignity of the country had been hurt by the students' actions. He pleaded for them to leave the square. May 16th marked the fourth day of the hunger strike. There were now 3,000 students participating. 600 of them were hospitalized due to exhaustion, disease, and hypoglycemia, or low blood sugar. Sixty of the students who had been hospitalized the day before returned to the square to continue their fast. Teachers, high school students, and factory workers showed their support by marching to the square. The welcoming ceremony for Gorbachev was moved from Tiananmen Square to Beijing Airport in reaction to the demonstrations. That evening, Yan Meng Fu appeared in the square alone to talk to the students. He expressed sympathy towards the students and let the student leaders know that he passed their demands on to the party leadership. Yan volunteered to offer himself as a hostage to the students, but the student leaders declined his offer. That night, the Chinese leaders met with Gorbachev. Zhao Zuyang talked to Gorbachev and told him that Deng was recognized as the nation's leader.
It's the first time that Deng's status as the national leader was made clear by a top party member, but it could also be construed as Zhao shifting the blame to Deng. Li Ping told Gorbachev that capitalist nations do not hold a monopoly on democracy and that reform will come soon to China. Many of the party leaders were ashamed that Gorbachev had to see the student demonstrations, and those party leaders took more of a hardline stance. After the Gorbachev meeting, Yan Mingfu told Li Ping the students remained patriotic, and he asked Li if the April 26th editorial could be retracted. Li refused the request. By May 17th, more than 2,000 hunger strikers were taken to local hospitals. At least a half dozen were critically ill and in danger of dying. With hot days and cold nights, the weather was quickly sapping the health of the fasting students. The Chinese Red Cross responded by sending in more medical personnel. That day, China witnessed its largest public demonstration since the founding of the Communist Republic. Two million people from all segments of society took to the streets to show their support for the students on hunger strike. They carried posters mocking Deng Xiaoping as senile and decrepit. Li Ping was also mocked. In an act showcasing how broad the protest movement was, a thousand officers from the People's Liberation Army joined the demonstrators as well as police officers and lower party officials. On that day, protests took place at more than 400 cities across China. Also that day, a group of intellectuals released the May 17th Declaration. They blamed the hunger strike on the party leadership's indifference to the students' just requests. There is still an emperor in China, only without a title, read the Declaration. Chinese students living in the United States published a letter of public support to their fellow students in China, and they begged Li Ping and Zhao Zuyang to open a dialogue with the students in Tiananmen Square. That evening, a PSC meeting was called at Deng's residence. At that meeting, Zhao Zuyang's concessions-based strategy, which called for the retraction of the April 26th editorial, was thoroughly criticized by the party hardliners. Li Ping and Deng asserted that by making a conciliatory speech on May 4th, Zhao exposed divisions within the top leadership and emboldened the students. Deng warned the party leadership that if Beijing was not pacified quickly, the country risked civil war and another cultural revolution. Deng then argued that martial law was needed as a show of the government's no-tolerance stance. Deng said that in order to justify martial law to the citizens, the party leaders would need to portray the demonstrators as tools of bourgeois liberalism, advocates who were pulling the strings behind the scenes. Further, they were being used as tools by elements within the party who wished to advance their personal ambitions. Early on the morning of May 18th, the top members of the Central Committee, including Zhao Zuyang and Li Ping, paid a visit to the Beijing hospital where some of the hunger strikers were being treated. The hospitalized students insisted they had no intention of overthrowing the government, but they urged the party to clean up the corruption and carry out political reform. They asked the leaders to visit the students in Tiananmen Square who were on hunger strike. The Central Committee leaders agreed that the students' requests were consistent with party policy and offered their wishes for the students' health. Later that day, Li Ping and Yan Min Fu met with about a dozen student representatives, including Wu Yar Kiexi and Wang Dan. Their meeting was carried on live television. Li said his only concern was rescuing the endangered hunger strikers. Wang Dan requested that the government acknowledge the student movement as patriotic, not disorderly, and that the party leadership must disclaim the April 26th editorial. Li Ping responded by saying that all hunger strikers must be relocated to local hospitals. It appeared that Li felt less threatened if the hunger strikers were no longer visible to the public and kept in a controlled place. The meeting ended without a resolution. The hunger strike was now on its sixth day, and on top of that, 30 students had gone on a water fast. Few humans can survive without water for more than one week, so this upped the urgency of the matter. Some of the hunger strikers had gone without urinating for more than 24 hours, and some were suffering circulatory problems. The shuttling of ambulances in and out of the square was becoming a common sight. 
In addition to that problem was the added difficulty of so many workers walking off their jobs to support the students that it left Beijing half paralyzed. Some of them carried banners saying, we are not afraid to be fired. At 4.45 on the morning of May 19th, Zhao Zuyang and Li Peng visited the fasting students in Tiananmen Square for the first time. With tears in his eyes, Zhao said, I am too late. Zhao appealed to the hunger strikers to end their fast. No promises were made, but he told them that reform would come soon. As Zhao spoke to the students through a bullhorn, witnesses reported that he was visibly trembling. His speech was heartily applauded by the students. In contrast, Li Ping did not speak. That day, the demonstrations continued to spread to other Chinese cities. Shanghai alone saw more than one million people out on the streets in support of the hunger strike. Later that day, the Politburo Standing Committee met with military leaders and party elders. Deng presided over the meeting and said that martial law was the only option. At the meeting, Deng declared that he was mistaken in choosing Hu Yaobang and Zhao Zhu Young as his successors, and resolved to remove Zhao from his position as general secretary. Deng also vowed to deal resolutely with Zhao's supporters and begin propaganda work. On Saturday, May 20th, Li Ping addressed the mid-level and senior-level members of the Communist Party as well as the army cadres, or political officers. Zhao Zhu Young was conspicuously absent from this vital meeting. Li demanded that the demonstrations stop immediately, and he blamed the demonstrations on organized outside agitators, and that it is only these select agitators who have denigrated Deng. Li read to the gathered members the prepared declaration. In view of the serious turmoil that has taken place in Beijing, which has greatly disturbed social order, security, and the people's normal life, and in order to extinguish the turmoil to maintain the city's peace, to ensure the safety of the citizens and their properties, to protect public properties, and to guarantee that the daily routine of the central and municipal governments is not disturbed, the State Council hereby announces that in accordance with the 16th regulation under item 89 of the Constitution, martial law will be carried out in certain parts of Beijing beginning at 10 o'clock Beijing time on the 20th day of May, 1989. The martial law will be imposed by the Beijing People's Government, which is entitled to work out the details of these measures as necessary. Troops of the People's Liberation Army were immediately ordered to enter and garrison in Beijing. Li stressed that the troops were not being sent to deal with the students, but to maintain order in the city. Following Li's declaration, at least 30 divisions were mobilized from five of the country's seven military regions. At least 14 of the PLA's 24 Army Corps contributed troops. As many as 250,000 troops were sent to the capital, some by air and some by rail. But the army's entry into the city was blocked at its suburbs by throngs of protesters. Tens of thousands of demonstrators surrounded military vehicles, preventing them from either advancing or retreating. The protesters lectured soldiers and appealed to them to join their cause. They also provided soldiers with food, water, and shelter. In between Zhao Zhu Young's speech at the square and the declaration of martial law, the students had ended their hunger strike. But the declaration outraged the students and their supporters. In response to Li Ping's announcement, 200,000 students declared they would start a hunger strike. Once again, the students joined in singing the Internationale as hundreds of thousands of citizens poured into the streets to support them. As news of the declaration of martial law spread, foreign governments criticized what they saw as an outrageous act, and demonstrations in support of the students at Tiananmen Square erupted in democratic countries all across the world. On May 22nd, the Central Committee issued a statement demanding that the head of government of each province and each municipality take a clear-cut stand in support of Li Ping's speech of May 20th. That day, there were more than 100,000 troops surrounding the city of Beijing brought in from numerous faraway provinces. The army soldiers were positioned throughout the city, particularly around Tiananmen Square. They often used underground passages to avoid crowds of demonstrators and their supporters. That night, there were reports of soldiers attacking students with brass belt buckles and bricks. <laughs> 
At least 40 people were injured. Meanwhile, more than 100 senior party members signed a petition asking the Central Committee not to use the army to repress the student demonstrators. Student leader Wu Yar Kieksi made a plea through loudspeakers asking the students to retreat to the foreign embassy area since the democratic movement was lost. After giving this speech, he fainted. That evening, 200,000 students and teachers met in Tiananmen Square to take an oath led by student leader Wang Dan. Heads may roll, blood may flow, but freedom and democracy must be carried on. We sacrifice our blood and lives in hope of a better tomorrow for the People's Republic. Students and government officials were both horrified when three men threw eggs and red, yellow, and black paint on the enormous photo portrait of the late Mao Zedong on May 23rd. Even among the protesters, the image of Chairman Mao still received reverential treatment as a great leader and the founder of modern communist China. The three men were captured by students and turned over to the police. Some students were suspicious when the military immediately produced a tarp that was 10 by 16 feet, just large enough to cover the portrait. Rumors flew back and forth across the capital on May 24th. One of those rumors was that both Li Ping and Zhao Zuyang were stepping down from their positions on the Central Committee. Most of the military leaders came out and supported Li Ping, but a few voiced dissent, including General Ye Fei, who verbally attacked Li. The demonstration spread to the independent Chinese city-states of Hong Kong and Macau. In the sprawling southern city of Guangzhou, population 14 million, 600,000 people took to the streets in support of the students at Tiananmen Square. Rumors were rampant at the Guangzhou march that Li Ping had stepped down. In Beijing, the army's numerous attempts to filter into the city were blocked at the suburbs by masses of protesters. Tens of thousands of demonstrators surrounded military vehicles, preventing them from either advancing or retreating. Seeing no way forward, the authorities ordered the army to withdraw all of the military forces to bases outside the city. On May 25th, the Beijing Workers' Autonomous Union organized a march through the streets that drew one million people. Some of the Beijing citizens even organized Dare to Die Corps, based on the popular martyr organizations from the 1911 rebellions that brought down the emperor and the monarchy. After long debates among the student leaders, the leadership decided on May 26th to continue their occupation of Tiananmen Square, as well as to organize a larger demonstration or hunger strike, and they would call for a workers' general strike. That day, the Central Committee formally announced the dismissal of Zhao Zuyang. The committee charged Zhao with a number of mistakes that led to the demonstrations and resulting turmoil. Most seriously, they accused him of attempting to grab power from Deng and Li Ping. On May 27th, faced with factional bickering and the deterioration of sanitary conditions due to crowding, the student leaders decided that the protesters should withdraw from Tiananmen Square on May 30th and expand their efforts into an all-Beijing demonstration and rally. The leadership wanted the protest to include people from all walks of life and not just students. At the same time, Chinese students in France called for a great march of Chinese all over the world to take place on May 28. On May 28, the Great March did take place, with students in Taiwan, Macau, Japan, the United States, and Australia participating. In Hong Kong, more than 1.5 million people took to the streets in a march around the city. The march in Beijing that day, by comparison, was not nearly as large. On May 29th, many of the student leaders collectively resigned, feeling that they could not settle the dispute between the Beijing students and the students outside of Beijing. Both Wang Dan and prominent leader Chai Ling resigned. The rest of the student leaders decided to postpone their organized withdrawal from Tiananmen Square until June 20th, the day the National People's Congress was scheduled to convene. On May 30th, a group of art students erected a Goddess of Democracy statue, constructed out of foam and paper mache over a steel structure. The statue stood over 30 feet high and was prominently displayed at the front of the square facing the newly hung and unvarnished portrait of Chairman Mao. That day, leaders of the Beijing Workers' Autonomous Union were arrested and taken away by the public security police. <laughs> 
Nearly a thousand students and workers stood in front of the Beijing Public Security Bureau demanding the release of those detained. After the new student leadership convened, they elected to keep the date of their withdrawal from the square open. The students notified the government that they would resume a dialogue after the government met four conditions. One, rescind the declaration of martial law. Two, remove the army from Beijing. Three, guarantee not to settle accounts after their disagreements were resolved. And four, to fulfill freedom of the press as guaranteed in the Constitution. On May 31st, the People's Daily published a statement from the Tiananmen Square Management Office accusing the students of placing the figure of the goddess of democracy in the square illegally. At 10 o'clock that morning, a man climbed up the framework of the figure and tried to push it over. The man was taken away by the students and detained at the students' headquarters, but they released him that day. Later that morning, a group of more than 10 military motorcycles followed by military jeeps, patrolled Beijing streets. Some foreign journalists guessed that the show of force was a warning by the government that it was about to lose its patience. That afternoon, thousands of party cadres, students, and peasants marched in a counter-demonstration in the suburbs of Beijing. They shouted pro-government slogans and blamed the student and the worker strikes on troublemakers. After the strike, witnesses reported that they were served ice cream by the government. That evening, several thousand students and workers demonstrated in front of the Beijing Public Security Bureau, demanding the release of the workers taken into custody the day before. The police warned them to obey the martial law order at once and to leave immediately. The demonstrators were unaware that the workers had been released earlier that day. That night, thousands demonstrated next to Shiwaman Gate. The police took no action, but government officials pushed away foreign reporters and television cameras. On June 1st, there was a kidnapping attempt on former student leader Chai Ling and her husband, Fang Kong. The kidnapping effort failed and the kidnappers ran away. Chai Ling recognized the kidnappers as fellow student demonstrators who may have been bribed by the government. Chao Ling vowed to fight on, despite the attempts against her. That afternoon, many of the large hotels in Beijing hung streamers that stated their support for the government. June 1st is Children's Day in China, and many parents took their children to Tiananmen Square. During this lull in the demonstrations, the students worked hard at cleaning the garbage that was collecting in the square due to their occupation. They also replaced old filthy tents with new clean tents. That evening, rumors of Deng Xiaoping's illness were denied by Foreign Ministry spokesman Li Xinhua. In a further clampdown on information about events in the square, a spokesman for the municipal government of Beijing issued a list of seven warnings to the foreign press. 1. During martial law, all foreign journalists must receive a permit from the government to cover news in Beijing. 2. Foreign journalists are banned from the interviewing, photographing, or videotaping activities prohibited under the order of martial law. 3. Pictures of government troops or police are prohibited without government permission. 4. It is illegal for foreign journalists to obtain materials that may incite people and that are banned under the martial law. 5. The municipal authorities may override any laws in place prior to the imposition of martial law. 6. Violators will be prosecuted to the degree of seriousness of their crime by the appropriate authorities. And 7. The municipal government reserves the right to interpret the orders issued by their office. As June 1st turned to June 2nd, there were more than 200,000 soldiers stationed around the city of Beijing. The army was in control of all of the major media, television stations, radio stations, newspapers, telegraph offices, and post offices. In the early morning hours, more than 10,000 troops broke into Tiananmen Square, but they were quickly surrounded by hundreds of thousands of students and citizens. Chaos reigned in the streets until the troops retreated around 3 a.m. Around the same time, a speeding police car with no plates ran up onto the sidewalk and hit four people, killing two of them on the spot. The police car continued on, telling witnesses, Get out of our way! We're in a hurry! The incident outraged many citizens who had taken no position until that time. 
Many joined the protesters and placed obstacles in the streets to block more soldiers from entering the square. Later that day, Li Ping issued a report titled On the True Nature of the Turmoil, which was circulated to every member of the Politburo. The report aimed to persuade the Politburo of the necessity and legality of clearing Tiananmen Square by referring to the protesters as terrorists and counter-revolutionaries. The report stated that the turmoil was continuing to grow, the students had no plans to leave, and they were gaining popular support, all of which was probably true after the incident with the police car. Following more pro-government demonstrations in the suburbs, a participant revealed that those who attended the pro-government rallies received 10 Chinese dollars and two days of paid leave. In response, thousands of students launched a mock pro-government rally, shouting, Support the dictatorship and despotism! And the demonstrations have government sanction. Join the demonstration and get $10. Just tell them you support Li Ping. Also on that day, Deng Xiaoping and several party leaders met with the three remaining Politburo Standing Committee members, Li Ping, Qi Ao Shi, and Yao Yilin. The three members agreed with Deng's decision to clear the square so that the riot can be halted and order restored to the capital. They also agreed that the square needed to be cleared as peacefully as possible. But if the protesters did not cooperate, the troops were authorized to use force to complete the job. That day, state-run newspapers reported that troops were positioned in 10 key areas in the city. Units of the 27th, 65th, and the 24th Armies were secretly moved into the Great Hall of the People on the west side of the square and the Ministry of Public Security compound east of the square. That night, there were reports that an Army trench-digging vehicle ran into four civilians, killing three, and sparking fear that the army and the police were trying to advance into Tiananmen Square. The student leaders issued emergency orders to set up roadblocks at major intersections to prevent the entry of troops into the center of the city. In the early hours of June 3rd, the Xinhua News Agency broadcast the full text of the Mobilization Order for Action, an 8,000-character document written by the Propaganda Ministry justifying the need for violent, overwhelming force to put an end to the turmoil in Tiananmen Square. In the early morning hours, soldiers forced their way into the city, provoking incidents with citizens and students who attempted to stop them. Four tourist shuttle buses used to transport supplies and weapons for the army were captured outside the city by civilians. Inside the buses, the civilians found machine guns, rifles, grenades, and gas masks. The weapons were put on display at Shiwaman Gate and attracted the attention of more than 10,000 people. Later that day, plainclothes military personnel were discovered with city maps that were being used to plan their attack. Around noon that day, military personnel and armed policemen came flooding out of the west gate of Zhuangnanhai, the headquarters for the Chinese Communist Party. This force closed off the main arteries near the square, separating the protest groups. The police broadcast warnings to the demonstrators while throwing tear gas canisters and waving electric batons. Shortly after, two to three hundred soldiers dashed out from behind the Xiuanmen Gate and struck randomly at the protesters with wooden poles and electric batons. On the other side of the square, soldiers shot rubber bullets into the crowds of people. At 2 a.m., 10,000 soldiers charged out of the People's Hall and attempted to block a busy intersection at Jianmen Road. However, the students and civilians put a stop to these efforts by blocking their way with two large public buses. Around 100,000 people gathered at the intersection and chased off the troops by pelting them with rocks. The angry crowd moved on to Chang'an Avenue, where they turned over an army jeep and broke the windows on two tourist buses delivering more weapons. At 4.30 p.m., the three Politburo Standing Committee members met with Beijing Party Secretary Li Ziming, Mayor Chen Zitong, State Council Secretary Lo Gan, and the military leaders. At the meeting, they finalized the order for the enforcement of martial law. Here is how it was to work. First, the operation to quell the counter-revolutionary riot was to begin at 9 o'clock p.m. Second, military units would converge on the square by 1 o'clock a.m. on June 4th, and the square had to be cleared by 6 a.m.
Third, no delays would be tolerated. Fourth, no persons were allowed to impede the advance of the troops enforcing martial law. The troops were allowed to act in self-defense and use any means necessary to clear impediments. Fifth, this warning will be broadcast to the citizens through the state media. The order did not explicitly contain a shoot-to-kill directive, but permission to use any means was understood by most units as authorization to use lethal force. That evening, the leaders monitored the operation from the Great Hall of the People. Beginning at 6 p.m., the radio and TV stations issued three emergency orders signaling the forthcoming violent suppression. At 6.30, the Army units within the city received the order. It warned everybody in the area to obey the martial law. Should anyone ignore this advice and challenge authority, the army, police, and armed police have the power to use whatever means necessary to force him to obey the order. At 8.30 p.m., an order was broadcast warning that the army can tolerate no more and will adopt all possible measures to remove obstacles. At the time of the order, there were still several hundred thousand people in Tiananmen Square. At 10 p.m., the third order was issued. People were told to stay inside their houses to avoid danger. The People's Liberation Army units advanced on Beijing from every direction. The 38th, 63rd, and 28th Armies from the West. The 15th Airborne Corps, 20th, 26th, and 54th Armies from the South. The 39th Army and the 1st Armored Division from the East and the 40th and 64th Armies from the North. Shortly after 10 p.m., the 38th Army opened fire on protesters at the Wu Kik Song intersection on Chung An Avenue, about seven miles west of the square. The crowds were stunned that the Army was using live ammunition and reacted by hurling rocks and bricks at the soldiers. Song Zhao Ming, a 32-year-old aerospace technician, killed at Wu Kisong, was the first confirmed fatality of the night. The soldiers used expanding bullets that expand upon entering the body, which creates larger wounds, but is less likely to exit the body and harm bystanders. At 10.30 p.m., the army was briefly halted at Mugsadai, three miles west of the square by trolley buses that were moved across the bridge and set on fire by the crowds of people that were now gathering in the area. The 38th Army opened fire on the crowds, inflicting heavy casualties, with one report stating that as many as 36 people were killed at Muxadai. There were also reports of soldiers raking the high-rise apartment buildings there, where high-ranking government officials and foreigners lived, with machine gun fire, killing people inside the building. Using armored personnel carriers, the 38th Army rammed through the buses blocking the bridge. To the south, paratroopers of the 15th Airborne Corps also used live ammunition, causing civilian deaths in four different Beijing districts. One armored car on Chung An Avenue was stopped and held up by civilians. They rushed the car into the middle of the boulevard to block the passage of more armored cars. However, the next armored car plowed into the stopped car, throwing all the soldiers inside to the ground, killing one of them. The military directive was now so extreme that the army was willing to sacrifice the lives of its own soldiers. The killings infuriated city residents, some of whom attacked soldiers with sticks, rocks, and Molotov cocktails, setting fire to the military vehicles. Back in Tiananmen Square, army helicopters could be seen. The students in the square put out a call to all local schools asking for reinforcements. By 10.30 p.m., news of the bloodshed to the west and south of the city began trickling into the square, often told by witnesses drenched in blood. At 12.15 a.m. on June 5th, a flare lit up the sky over the square, signaling to all armed forces it was time to move in on the occupiers. At that time, it was estimated that there were 70 to 80,000 demonstrators still in the square. Armed personnel carriers moved in from the south and the west. The students threw bricks and chunks of cement at the military vehicles. One stalled when a metal bar was thrown between the treads. The students immediately surrounded it and threw gasoline-soaked blankets on top of the vehicles. The blankets were lit and the soldiers inside were forced out due to the heat. Although the APC had been seen earlier running over occupied tents, a group of students hustled the occupants out to safety. There were many calls by students to retaliate violently against the government actions, but for the most part they remained peaceful.
At 1.30 a.m., the vanguard of the 38th Army and paratroopers from the 15th Airborne Corps, representing Dung's most loyal and best trained units, closed in from the north and south ends of the square. They sealed off the square from any incoming demonstrators and shot anyone who attempted to enter. At that point, the 24th, 27th, and 65th Armies began pouring out of government buildings into the square. By 2 a.m., the students at the Monument to the People's Heroes found themselves completely surrounded. Warning shots were fired over their heads as the students pleaded with the soldiers to comply with the will of the people and put away their weapons. At 2.30, several workers appeared with a confiscated machine gun that they intended to use against the soldiers, but the students convinced them to surrender their weapon. At 3.30 a.m., two Red Cross doctors negotiated with the lead army political officer at the square for the safe evacuation of the remaining demonstrators. After receiving approval from party leaders, the officer agreed to the evacuation. At 4 a.m., the lights in the square were turned off, and a voice came over the government loudspeakers. Clearance of the square begins now. We agree with the student's request to clear the square. Unaware of the doctor's agreement, the demonstrators prepared for the worst. At 4.30, the doctors conveyed their agreement to the students. The lights were turned back on, and the soldiers advanced on the students, still encircled around the monument. Many of the students were angry at the doctors for having negotiated a withdrawal. The soldiers advanced to within 30 feet of the students and lowered their weapons, ready to aim and fire. Behind the soldiers were tanks and APCs, also ready to take action if needed. Student leader Feng Kong asked for a voice vote of whether they should stay or leave. Although many witnesses say the stay vote was louder, Fang declared the go voices won out. At 4.40, a squad of soldiers in camouflage uniforms appeared and shot out the student speakers. At that point, many of the soldiers moved in, kicking and beating the demonstrators, destroying their cameras and other recording equipment. The soldiers used clubs and the butts of their guns to attack the students, most of whom had given up at that time and were trying to escape the square. At 5.10, a large group of students linked hands and proceeded to exit toward the southeast corner of the square through a cordon of army troops. Those who refused or straggled were beaten until they were bloody. Once the square was cleared, officers ordered the soldiers to relinquish their ammunition as the soldiers were given several hours to rest and the square was cleaned of debris. Chai Ling and other students who had occupied the square accused the government of burning the bodies so there would be no evidence of the number of people killed. Just past 6 a.m., as a convoy of students who had vacated the square were walking westward in the bicycle lane along Chung An Avenue back to campus, three tanks pursued them from the square, firing tear gas. One drove through the crowd, killing 11 students and injuring scores. Later that morning, thousands of civilians tried to re-enter the square, including the parents of students who had been there the night before. But they were met by a cordon of soldiers who fired their guns above their heads. The crowd turned around and ran. Many were shot in the back as they fled. There followed a period of terrifying chaos in the city as the army gunned down students and citizens near the square and in other areas of the city. Screams echoed through the night as flames rose through the piles of debris and from army trucks or tanks hit by homemade bombs. Hospitals were overwhelmed by the number of dead and wounded, but were in many cases forbidden to treat the civilian casualties. There were also PLA victims viciously attacked by the angry crowds. Although the army and other authorities did what they could to remove the dead as quickly as possible, photographic evidence still remains of the carnage. The day of June 5th will be remembered by most outside of China as the day one lone man held up a column of tanks by refusing to step out of their way. The image of one small individual stopping a column of tanks from moving down Chang'an Avenue while holding a shopping bag remains one of the great iconic photos of the 20th century. Wherever the lead tank went, the man stepped in front to block its movement. Eventually, he climbed on top of the turret and spoke directly to soldiers inside the lead tank. When he finished his conversation, he blended back into the crowd and has not been identified to this day. There were reports that day of some soldiers abandoning their vehicles when they became stuck among debris and other obstacles. 
There were also unverifiable reports of clashes among different PLA units. That day, the city of Beijing was in virtual shutdown as most people refused to report to work out of fear of being attacked by the military. Public transit was severely limited. It would be several days after the army had taken control of Tiananmen Square that life in Beijing would return to a semblance of normal. In the weeks and months that followed the crackdown at Tiananmen Square, the government authorities arrested thousands of people. Many of the workers were summarily tried and executed. On the other hand, many of the students, often coming from affluent or well-connected families, received lighter punishments. Wang Don, who was at the top of the government's wanted list, served seven years in prison. Under Operation Yellowbird, Chai Ling and Wu Yar Kik Sing, with the help of foreign governments and NGOs, escaped out of China to new homes in Western nations along with other student leaders. Zhao Zhu Young was placed under house arrest immediately after he was removed from his position of power. He remained under tight supervision and was allowed to leave his courtyard compound or receive visitors only with permission from the highest echelons of the party. The government rather successfully kept him hidden from news reports and history books. After his arrest, Deng and his successors continued to believe that Zhao and his subordinates had worked secretly to organize the nationwide protests and worried that his death might trigger protests similar to those sparked by the death of Hu Yaobang. He died of pneumonia in 2004, still under detention. After Zhao died, Chinese leaders heavily controlled the news of his death. TV and radio stations were prohibited from broadcasting the news of his passing. The People's Liberation Army was put on special notice. Security was increased around Tiananmen Square, and all of the main Chinese newspapers were instructed to run a brief 59-word obituary that left out mention of his many accomplishments and positions of leadership. Although there is strict censorship by the Chinese government of any mention of Tiananmen Square, including any numerical referencing to the date 6-4-1989, there are still many in China who remember the event and find ways to honor those who died during the crackdown. More public remembrances are observed by the many Chinese people who live abroad, particularly in the more open Western nations. For the generation born after the massacre, the event is almost completely unknown. The authorities have worked to suppress all information about the crackdown, while the rising economy, along with enactment of many of the economic reforms the students fought for, meant that most young Chinese did not have to endure the high inflation and difficult times that plagued their parents' generation. In 1990, the Chinese government put out their response to the causes for the demonstrations in Tiananmen Square and throughout the country in a book called The Truth About the Beijing Turmoil. Here is how they defended their actions. This turmoil was not a chance occurrence. It was a political turmoil incited by a very small number of political careerists after a few years of plotting and scheming. It was aimed at subverting the Socialist People's Republic. By making use of some failings in the work of the Chinese government and the temporary economic difficulties, they spread far and wide many views against the Constitution, the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party, and the people's government. Preparing the ground for the turmoil ideologically, organizationally, and in public opinion. The former General Secretary of the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party, Zhao Zuyang, supported the turmoil and thus has unshirkable responsibility for its formation and development. The various political forces and reactionary organizations abroad had a hand in the turmoil from the very beginning. Some newspapers, magazines, and broadcasting stations, especially the Voice of America, fabricated rumors to mislead people, thus adding fuel to the flames. Andrew Nathan, a political science professor at Columbia University, explained why the Chinese rarely talk about the incident in his article, How China Made the Tiananmen Square Massacre Irrelevant. It is wrong to compare modern China with the China we knew before the Tiananmen Square crackdown. China is a much better place to live now for most people. Consider the original aims of the protesters. They wanted democracy, famously hoisting up a model of the Statue of Liberty just days before the crackdown. But they also sought more concrete goals, such as the right to choose their own profession following graduation. Two and a half decades later, 
young Chinese people now have far more freedom to pursue the career of their choice, travel abroad, and marry whomever they choose, although gay marriage is outlawed. Far more Chinese citizens than before have access to the country's social safety net, including a rudimentary health care system, and a much greater proportion of China's population can realistically obtain a university education. These advancements do not excuse China of its continued human rights violations, but they do explain how the party can remain popular despite repression, corruption, and other problems. In an interview in Reset Doc magazine, Nathan talked about the changes that resulted from the crackdown. The impact of Tiananmen has been paradoxical. Instead of marking the beginning of the end of authoritarianism in China, Tiananmen led to the strengthening of authoritarianism in China, what I have called resilient authoritarianism. First, the events impressed upon the party leadership the necessity to stay united, and that lesson has been so strong that the ruling party managed the power transition from Deng Xiaoping to Jiang Zemin on down to China's current leader, Xi Jinping, with few public signs of power struggle. Second, the events of Tiananmen taught the regime the need to improve its repressive apparatus, like its National Armed Police Force and Internet Police. Third, not as a direct result of Tiananmen, but as an indirect result, the regime rededicated itself to the importance of economic growth as a way of maintaining popular support. With successful management over the years, this policy has produced sustained, high-level economic growth, which has enabled the regime to maintain popular support. Thus, after nearly 30 years, we see a regime that is apparently more secure than on the eve of Tiananmen. We see a general public mood that places less value on the idea of democracy than was the case 30 years ago. And we see a younger generation that has almost no idea of what happened 30 years ago or why it matters. The current political system is functioning effectively. It has produced political order, economic growth, and a string of foreign policy successes. The system has been able to produce qualified new leaders. With the economy growing, most people are better off and are optimistic about their personal economic futures. For now, the public is not calling for change. To be sure, there are lots of problems, of which the most pressing is probably corruption. But so far, since Tiananmen, there has occurred neither an internal crisis of the regime nor a crisis in state-society relations. Thus, nothing forces the regime to change the rules of the political game. I will also add that China had experienced what some called the century of humiliation starting with the first opium war, which forced the Chinese to accept the selling of opium to their citizens, and ended with the final withdrawal of the Japanese occupation forces in 1945. During that time, the Western European powers and later the Japanese ran the country with little or no regard for the welfare or safety of its citizens. This, after existing for millennia as the Middle Kingdom, that special nation that due to its long history of civilization, about 7,000 years, and its status as an economic and military juggernaut, made China until the 19th century always one of the most important nations on the planet. Maybe the return of that status was more important to the average Chinese person than such intangibles as free speech, free assembly, and a free press. After all, in the last year, we've seen the world grow more authoritarian and nationalistic and less democratic and global. Perhaps the surviving orchestrators of the crackdown at Tiananmen Square feel a bit vindicated. I appreciate your joining me for the Podcast of Doom. Please feel free to comment regarding your thoughts by emailing me at podcastofdoom at aol.com or visit me at www thepodcastofdoom.com. If you like the show, please remember to leave a review or rating on your preferred podcast provider, whether that is iTunes or another carrier. Also, I'm taking questions about any previous episode or the podcast in general, and I hope to have the segment out very soon. Following the question and answer episode, I will put together the topics for the next five episodes, including some of your suggestions. Keep those suggestions coming. You are constantly keeping me informed about important disasters and catastrophes. Until then, keep your ears pinned and your tail taut. And now, for a little lead-out music, Billy Bragg will perform The International.